Growing up, my brother and I would play at the local playground in the middle of our grandparents' small rural town. The park had steep metal slides that were sure to burn our legs in the summer, and a seesaw that my brother and I would climb on. We would shift our weight to keep the seesaw perfectly balanced in the air, and sometimes we would glare at each other as if playing chicken to see who would be the first to quickly slip off their seat, sending the other crashing to the ground. If you weren't quick enough to land on your feet, you were going home with a bruised tailbone. In 2023, Gallup reported that America's confidence in major institutions such as banking, education, religion, and government was historically the lowest it has ever been. Like a seesaw, trust has been declining for decades, but there was always enough trust in the older or youngest generations to keep the seesaw somewhat balanced and institutions funded and functional. As confidence has steadily declined, some have said that the seesaw is finally tipping with more generations distrusting than ever. It isn't helping that Gen Z has been watching evidence of institutional mismanagement in real time online and in social media. With so much speculation around Gen Z, I wanted to bring on Matthew Weiss, a Marine Corps intelligence officer, Gen Z, and author of the book, We Don't Want You, Uncle Sam, to help us understand what Gen Z is really asking for. Through the lens of his personal motivations for service, as well as connections to peers, and his previous experience with cutting-edge defense technology companies, his book has sparked conversations on the highest levels. I'm Corey Weathers. You're listening to Military Culture Shift, a limited series podcast on the impact of war, money, and generational perspective on morale, retention, and leadership. Matthew, thank you so much for joining and talking with me. You know, Gen Z is particularly hard to get in touch with and also um, to generate conversation around what your experience is like in the military, but even more, which is what your book is about, is really talking about the recruiting crisis and what's going on with being able to really sell Gen Z on coming into the force. So thank you so much for joining me and talking with me. And, um, and thank you for writing this book. It's a phenomenal book. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to have a good discussion today uh, and to really delve into some of the Gen Z specific topics about military recruitment, but about the military and Gen Z in general. Well, I, you and I both know the Gen Z. I think, do you track the same thing as far as the Pew research is, as I do, as far as Gen Z being 2012 and older, which makes Gen Z, what, 20, almost 26 now. 12, 25, 26 is like the upper and lower bounds of the generation. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. Which, which means we have a good chunk of Gen Z that's actually in the forest today. In fact, when I was doing my research, I'm thinking somewhere around um, 20 to 30%, I think of the force could be Gen Z at this point. Do you know of a better number for that by chance? Yeah, it'll, it'll by the end of the next two years, it'll get up to 40 and then obviously 50% and it becomes much larger. But you're absolutely right. That's, that's accurate. And it's quickly becoming the dominant generation serving which I think is super important because when we talk about leading the next generation and we talk about how do the generations work together better within the force, I think that's a key for leaders to understand is who it is that you're leading and who is in your ranks. Because I think I w- I'm Gen X and Gen X is above 40 to 41. And so I would say that a lot of Gen X, especially maybe even the few boomers that are still in the force today, I think think that Gen X is really the majority when, or maybe millennials when really Gen X or Gen Z is really growing. So um, why don't we just start with you sharing why did you want to write this book? And um, I think there's probably a lot listening that if they're in the military today are a little bit surprised how you accomplished being an active duty service member and writing a book at the same time. (laughs) Absolutely. So I very simply wrote the book right after initial training was done as I was going to sort of specialized training. So within the one year mark or so, um, the idea wasn't in my head at all before I joined, but I joined, had a really great group of uh, mentors and leaders that I talked with right in the beginning. And then I was watching the news quite simply one day, just simply listening and watching the news. And they were talking about the Gen Z recruiting crisis. And I've seen a segment on both, you know, left wing and right wing news stations. So I knew it was a 
clear national issue. And this particular station was had these unbelievable leaders, admirals, generals, real you know American heroes speaking about the Gen Z recruiting crisis. But I was sitting there and I, I thought, these people were recruited twenty to thirty years ago. They're not even millennials. These are like the old, the old dudes, you know. With all respect, what do they know about what's on my brother who's in high school's Instagram feed or his Facebook? That that is way out of date, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so I realized, wait, there's a missing, there's a missing piece here. There's like a Gen Z perspective that needs to be told and talked about. So I sort of burrowed down and just decided to write like crazy. Um, a lot of you know asking how, a lot of not going out on weekends and staying in and uh, just really sitting there and writing. I, I would lock myself in my room from 1600 on Friday. I wouldn't leave till eight on Monday just to write for many, many months in a row, basically. But I, I felt it was a really important mission and really important story and perspective to tell uh, and to compile. A lot of it was compilation, right? I was crowdsourcing these discussions with my peers, my junior enlisted peers, my peer officer friends, like actually gaining a lot of pure Gen Z value and putting that all together and saying, hey, this is uh, this is the final product. <laughs> I'm so, so glad you did because like I said, I think it's really difficult for all the generations right now. In fact, that's one of the biggest questions I get from leaders is where are Gen Z, <laughs> right? Because they're not necessarily all on TikTok, although may they, they may be. Um, it's just a different group that functions differently on a daily basis than most people are familiar with. And so I don't know about you. I'd love to know what your response was. But when I was listening to those same um, news segments about what's going on with the recruiting crisis in Gen Z. Um, and when I would hear them say Gen Z um, is not meeting, able to meet standards for weight and mental health, um, or in the beginning there, I would hear things about Gen Z is just not as patriotic. I have a little bit of a fire lit within me because although I think there's traces of that that could be true, it wasn't, from my perspective, the biggest issue. Did you feel the same way? Uh, absolutely. So uh, Senator Tom Cotton has documented, you know, and sworn congressional hearings on this. You know, the military, unfortunately, the large DOD will use like the requirements issue as as sort of a cop out, right? Oh, well, only 20% of the population is qualified. I think that that statistic is wrong. It needs to be sort of washed away. I think we need to do better to attract uh, the right people and understand what these, you know, ethereal requirements that we're pushing people away for actually are. And if they're not related to force lethality and the actual ability of the force, then we need to do some more homework and actually analyze those. Regarding the patriotic point, I don't personally think that Gen Z, this is anecdotal, right? It's hard to actually prove this statistically, is any less patriotic than past generations, cares any less. I don't think that's true. I think we are demanding of our institutions more because Mm -hmm. we know more. So we do qu- require more transparency. There's no question. Um, if you look at some of the polling, the average trust in the military has fallen. Right? It used to poll 80, 90 percent. If polls around 50 percent, if that, it's still the highest polling institution out of all of the American institutions, definitely higher than Congress, but uh, not as high as it used to be. So Gen Z demands more. They demand that transparency, that extra layer of understanding. Are their leaders really telling the truth? So it becomes sort of a harder world, right? It becomes a more clear, necessary world, but that's the world that Gen Z requires and demands. Um, and so you really need to be real with Gen Z. So no, I don't think that we're any less patriotic. I think we demand a little bit more transparency. And I don't think like, oh, this is the worst generation. We're so out of shape. I, you know, We're so not qualified. I don't think that's true. I think there's a lot of perception problems going Mm on, right? There are requirements problems and perception problems. That's how I frame them. And the perception matters. The marketing, the brand of service of DOD in general actually really matters. Um, And that impacts Gen Z very, very intensely. You know, when I um, talked with this historian that really focused on World War One and some of the mo- driving motivations for those coming in of, but also out of World War One and just the culture around that time, like honor and duty was really their words or their driving motivations. And I think that um, those of us that remember 9-11 have a picture in our head of, of patriotism that we lived through where we remember that feeling right after 9-11. And so I wonder if that 
that's where some people are coming from and that Gen Z didn't have or doesn't remember that experience, that it's maybe a different kind of patriotism, but it doesn't mean that they're not patriotic and that they don't want to serve their country. Um, so I don't know how you feel about that, because I know you've also talked about Gen Z, you know, is now reading 9-11 in their textbooks. And there aren't any textbooks, by the way. They're all digital, right? So it's it's history for them. Yeah. So I think the way I classify my generation, the three major events that impacted us, and, and you correctly point out, we don't have a 9-11. We did not have that key political patriotic rally around the flag event that then led to obviously military conflict. That doesn't impact us at all, except you know growing up into it. Right? We we don't remember either. We weren't born, or the few of us that were born of Gen Z uh, don't have any cognitive memory of that. So the three events that impacted us to to get to the heart of your question are the Great Financial Crisis, the recession. Right? That was a big economic, mm-hmm. worldwide economic event that hit a lot of American pockets, a lot of American families, a lot of Gen Zers witnessed their parents struggle with work from that. We witnessed the 2016 election, regardless of which political side you could have rooted for one or the other, it doesn't matter. We've seen a divisive politics in this nation, right? That I think both sides are hurting from all all people are hurting from this divisiveness, this lack of unity. And Gen Z sees that. It looks at politics on not as an exciting thing, but as sort of a divisive uh, thing. And, and we know we've per- been perceptive enough that this isn't normal, right? The, this mm-hmm. is not a normal political time based on what our elders are telling us, right? It's definitely heightened intensity. And the last one, obviously the most recent, but it impacted many Gen Zers in their high school, in their college, or in their elementary school, middle school time period, even obviously it was COVID. That was a huge mm-hmm. change event. And as big as that was for the whole world, it was most impactful for kids going to school or kids in a generation that then you like grew up with that key event. They're always going to look back on their childhood and remember COVID-19, right? So that three, those three events create sort of our own little Gen Z history and the way that we look at things. Again, with patriotism, you're absolutely right about how people will respond to it differently. What does it really mean to be patriotic? I think the best explanation I've heard about patriotism or how Gen Z looks at those three events in our timeline we're very pragmatic. We care about protecting. We're less millennial, go forth, service oriented. We're more protect what is good, protect what is normal, right? Get mm-hmm. back to normalcy, protect that normalcy and have a desire for protection and to protect. And I think that's an appeal and a good marketing appeal to Generation Z and something interesting. If I can just add another point that I think yeah. you would find fascinating, like, you know, there used to be this high extolled virtue of service. Or, you know, when someone asks, why did you join? You know, the highest thing is wave the flag and say, I serve because I'm patriotic to the nation. I think one thing Gen Z is very open with, and I think a society we should be okay with is the what's in it for me concept. And I, I'll explain that for a second. So, so Gen Z is very open with, hey, I am joining primarily because this is the best job I can get. Mm-hmm. This is a good way to pay for college. This is an adventure for me. Mm-hmm. This is a way to make friends and have an experience. This is a way to invest in my career. Or, you know, some and a good portion still, this is a, simply a patriotic calling that I had. Mm-hmm. Regardless, we shouldn't rank one of those reasons of joining over another. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of people, they, they want to hear the answer or they give higher points to, oh, he's serving because he's just doing it out of service and goodwill. Mm-hmm. A lot of the old or generations of service that I speak to are very adamant about that. I think that's wrong. I think we should be okay and accepting of any reason why a Gen Zer joins or any reason they put on a uniform and not rank one that's more in minds noble than another. We should be okay and open with all of that. And so that's, I think, another part to the patriotism answer. Well, what do you think about the fact that a lot of people call Gen Z the mass shooter generation? Yeah. So mental health and mass shootings are a are, are huge play on gen, like a huge impact on Generation Z, right? There is no question because of the impact. And I grew up with this. This is from personal experience and then from friend experience. Every single one of us, mm-hmm. this is in the book, had an escape plan from every single class that you sat in in high school. Full stop. That did not exist in my parents' generation. It didn't exist in most millennial generation, right? That literally was in every kid's plan. Like from the most intense person who thought about it to the least, like the thought would go off, right? So that obviously creates a huge mental health epidemic in itself. We see from the data, the one thing that Gen Z is statistically significant on 
is mental health struggle, depression, mm-hmm. anxiety, etc. Coupled with mass shooting, mass shootings obviously are um are you know our social media background. We didn't grow up with social media like millennials were. Oh, maybe in middle school, the earliest ones, mostly in high school and college, they had social media. In the third grade, kids get social media. Kids are connected online in the second, the third grade. Like this is way earlier. Really part of actual learning and development is your sort of social media online presence that creates, it shows probably a lot more anxiety and a lot more depression. So there is a huge mental health epidemic for many reasons, and those are two of them that is impacting Generation Z. In my generation and the millennial generation, um, when we talked about mental health, it was mental illness. And that meant like an inability to function, right? Leads to mental illness or or could be diagnosed as mental illness. And then what are the treatment goals for that? And it's a medical conversation. And I feel like what the conversation has shifted to is now mental health and mental wellness. In some ways, you know, suffering is subjective. And so I think Gen Z being brought up, this is all they knew, right? This is all they've ever known. And so in some ways, I think it's going to lead to a very gritty group of, of people who have the ability to have the character to persevere through difficult circumstances. And that doesn't necessarily mean that if they struggle with anxiety or depression or just dark humor, as a lot of people talk about, doesn't necessarily mean that that is the same as mental illness. Well, I think Gen Z is is having or wanting an open dialogue conversation about mental health and coping for normal situation induced anxiety and depression that comes from growing up in an environment of um, mass shootings or just that hyper arousal or awareness. Is that anxiety or is that what Gen Z has always known? Do you see what I'm saying? Like, I think it's a different conversation depending on what you actually were conditioned through. Yeah, no, it's it's a great analysis. I actually like that a lot. I hadn't perfectly thought of it like that, but I like that, that it's not necessarily mental illness. It's mental wellness and concept thinking around that as work and life becomes knowledge and the, 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 competition of ideas becomes so important in all of our tasks. I mean, even even traditional blue collar industries swinging a hammer require much more knowledge work than in the past as work becomes more complicated. Mental wellness is the point. I mean, you hear all these wellness apps, these wearable devices, meditation, all these trends that are percolating in society sort of relate to that. It's not, okay, we're all mentally unhealthy, you know, and the 5% that are truly you know, needing intense medication or, or intense it's like you know, a psychotherapy. Val- I, we value it out of our circumstances. Yeah. We now value mental wellness as a key value in our life. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Because so much of our life is going to be from our ideas and going on in our heads. And so therefore that has to translate to our jobs and to our institutions. One of the struggles with many of these things is when society picks up an idea, the cutting edge businesses in society, for example, the, the startup or the well-funded business is going to easily adapt, understand that idea, analyze it, and then bring it in very quickly to the fold. Some of these older institutions, the bureaucracy that we love, but we call the military, right? It, it takes a while for these things to adapt. It's always going to be a challenge. We just simply move slower. We're more risk averse. We move slower. But these are things, and that's why it's so important to have these conversations that leaders need to hear and then percolate down and push down to all ranks and levels, right? So mental wellness isn't any softer or weaker. I mean, you look at the most elite units of the military, the most elite units, right? Special operations, you know, go-getter, crazy units. Mental wellness is a huge factor in those mm-hmm. units. And those guys are, and girls are pushed into total, total resiliency land, right? Super mm-hmm. intense. But they're still valuing interviews, interpersonal communication, mental wellness, mental health, because they know it's actually the secret to being successful, right? Um, so I think it's interesting and it's a struggle we're always going to have is pushing some of these forward thinking, positive ideas down into a very bureaucratic system that's sometimes slow to adapt. I personally am super excited of what Gen Z is bringing to the institution. Um, I mean, I'm also a mom of two Gen Zers, and so I see the strength of what they have to contribute. And so I think that what's different, the way that I would kind of crudely label it is I feel like millennials kind of came in and they typically are allowed, so, you know, group of people, social cause and purpose and not afraid to call people out, call brands and institutions out very loudly. 
that was as social media was kind of like taking off. So I think verbally was the best way and protests were the best way. And so they were kind of came to be known as a very loud generation. And what I love about Gen Z is Gen Z, from what I understand, please correct me if you would say it in a different way that Gen Z is kind of coming in in a, in a quieter way is basically just coming in and going, you know, we don't have to scream and shout like, but we can hold brands and institutions and, and companies to accountability for transparency, for authenticity, because you can see everything that you need to see before you join a company, before you, you know, sign anything like you can see everything that you need to see and evaluate that for yourself. And I feel like Gen Z is just voting voting with their feet. Like there's no need to protest when I could just walk away or there's no need to protest when, you know, I don't know if it's still as big as it was, but there's the ability to have cancel culture and cancel an institution much quieter than let's say the millennials did. And I think that that is disrupting generations who don't know how to respond to a quiet generation. So that's just kind of my words. How would you describe it and feel free to say it in a different way or challenge it completely? Yeah, no, no. I, I like the the noise. I, I think the saturation of knowledge is a key part of Gen Z, right? And, and I write about this. A lot of older generations struggle with the fact that the new employee quite literally can know more than you, right? Yeah. Not, I don't want to use the word smart because smart is, you know, what's IQ, EQ, whatever. But a lot of people like, oh, based on my experience, right? And now this is me very naively talking from a young person. But like, I hate to say it. Sometimes I look at the experience and I'm like, that's wrong. Like mm -hmm. your experience, yeah, no one's changed it for 15 years and I feel sorry for you because you're sh simply wrong. You don't have the same data that I have and I mm -hmm. know how to do this better. Sorry. Mm -hmm. and, and that's a, such a brash, rude statement. I don't mean it in such an abrasive way because we have to value experience always, right? But in the world, if we're going to use a spectrum, the level of the compounding knowledge that is now accessible is quickly eroding the value of certain experience, right? By all means, certain experience is always going to is always going to push past key knowledge because we're moving in hyperspeed. As I say, mm -hmm. knowledge is not moving from books. It's not moving from slow time period. It's moving at quick megabyte speeds, literally five second videos, and you're getting bombarded with a thousand things at one time, right? I still believe in books. I'm an author. You're an author. <laughs> books are the best way to learn things. Don't worry. But the point is people are learning much faster and they're being exposed to things faster. So there is that tension between sort of experience and knowledge. And there is that concept that Z does have a lot more at their fingertips, has a lot more value um, at their fingertips or has a lot more understanding of the world. So when you say, yes, vote with their feet, speak and be noisy, they're able to actually um, sort themselves in the right way. One thing I think that's interesting, just online behavior the millennial was more uh, the hive mind behavior, meaning mm -hmm. like something got big, a trend got big, everyone flocked to it, right? It was like all of us are on Facebook and then all of us are looking at this, almost like the beehive mind kind of, right? But no, nothing bad. That's just the, mm -hmm. the trend. Gen Z is much more bifurcated. We're much more, I don't want to say echo chambered, but we're influencer driven. Mm -hmm. So we have our own little separate chambers and whatever. And I follow this influencer and he follows this influencer and that sort of segments us it's a much stronger customer base or marketing base for these influencers but it's much more bifurcated and separated so we're we're more sorted i use that word sorting well i think that's what you mean by moving with your feet sorting i think is a, uh, what they say in you know political science or whatever it's proper you know we're sorting very very uh defined ways this I, i'm following this influencer she's following that one like and that is no longer breaks the hive mind and makes it Key. I see it. I see it almost as what I've heard from some Gen Z is that it's it's about efficiency, whereas I feel like uh, millennials created more efficient platforms um, for, you know, for the sake of like technological advancement. I feel like Gen Z came at it and said, what's the most efficient use of all these platforms? And so, you know, I'm going to go to Facebook to see what my parents and my grandparents are saying about me and to use Facebook marketplace. Right. Or I'm going to go to Instagram for these things. I'm going to go to this influencer for this thing. And I also had Gen Z's tell me that these peers or these influencers, um, it's a lot safer for getting accurate information than it, just getting it from a particular news source or a particular authority figure, which I think to your point on knowledge, um, authority figures and the idea of authority has changed. And so I think I wanna ask you the question, um, when you talk about experience, do you, is it, is it a better way to say that there is knowledge as far as who holds the, the most information 
you guys have so much access to that information and the ability to get it efficiently and quickly and multitask at the same time. Your brains are wired differently. But I think that there is still a value for wisdom. And that's where I think yes. mentoring is coming in. So can I see you shaking your head. So can you talk about this wisdom mentoring piece? Because I think that that surprises older generations a little bit because they don't realize that Gen Z, and I would even say millennials too now, really do want mentoring. 100%. 100%. So so it's interesting. It's, it's, it's a new relationship we have to analyze, right? Because before, yeah. right? the authority, like you said, was instantly given to the older person, right? Yeah. And my friends and I sat around, we, we joked, like we, we thought about Eisenhower, right? Let's choose Eisenhower. Eisenhower was sort of plucked by Marshall as a major to become this great leader, the supreme NATO allied commander winning over World War II, right? Um, but he was plucked early, you know, and at like 30s. And so we were, we were joking with ourselves, like, where's the 30-year-old general? The person that like has the right makeup, mind whatever doesn't have the knowledge mm. yet or the wisdom yet but he, he's the person that should lead but he just needs the right mentor to take him to that promise line. but he could do the job at 30 with the right mentors and the right advice so i, I love the the mentoring concept it's so important i personally would not be in the military had i not had amazing mentors who were mostly veterans both the my mba program and um at the first company i worked at because they they Help me understand what military life was, the larger picture, the larger benefit. And, and they were huge. And even in the military, the mentors have been unbelievable. We do seek out, we're taught in school now, seek out a mentor, seek out an old, old, uh, older advisor, just like how back in the old days there used to be apprenticeships. One of the great quotes I read, I do a lot of business reading or whatever, you know, anything that can be read in in this basic textbook format, right? can be repeated. It's not a unique skill, but stuff that exists in people's heads, that tacit knowledge that I can't really visualize. I can't really write down in a manual that everyone could do, right? So I had to clean a rifle. Everyone knows how to clean a rifle. You know, it's, it's a manual thing, but like how to recognize when an enemy is, you know, committing a flanking maneuver, that's that tacit knowledge you're trying to seek via experience. That's what the mentors intuitively know. And then via apprenticeships and via just was wise discussions, that's ways for them to pass down that knowledge. That I think is a hugely valuable mm -hmm. point. If we can pass, if mentors can pass down tacit wisdom, tacit knowledge, super valuable. So find people with tacit knowledge and use them as mentors. That's the key. I love it. I love which I it brings up a whole other conversation of how do we do that better in the force, especially when there's such a rank structure that creates so many barriers and boundaries between those mentors. And so did you want to comment on any, any of that? Like, is there anything that you would encourage leaders um, on what it could look like to mentor Gen Z? Um, especially if they're coming from like an old school mindset. I think most leaders want to mentor and I think most of them are willing to give the time to it, but there might be a few out there that are kind of thinking like, how do you do that um, with the current rank structure and the way that it is? Yeah, there, there's, there's two things. One of them is going to be a slightly funny point. It, it's that mentorship is the highest sign of flattery, right? If someone asks you to Will you be my mentor? You're instantly flattered. I've had this happen to me personally, and I've used this tactic many times to very high ranking people. Will you mentor me? Because instantly you see like, well, that person thinks I'm smart enough to mentor mm -hmm. him. And therefore I like that person, right? So it's mm -hmm. actually like a good thing. So almost the flip of your question is how do we convince more Gen Zers to use this mm -hmm. to say, hey, can, can you mentor me? Can you teach me? You know, because Again, it would create the relationship, but specifically on the mentor side, if you're, you know, more of a senior leader who is able to give mentorship, right, is is having these open, um, truly, I don't want to say safe, but truly open discussions, and and not just more of them, but actually having them in, in the real way, like not sitting down and saying we're going to discuss this PME now, but having like always going out and being able to have these these very open, safe, hey no rank right here. Like, let's just talk human to human for a second. You know, what are some things you're struggling with? We can hit all the topics. You want to talk about marriage? We can talk about marriage. You want to talk mm -hmm. about, um, you know, what you're struggling with on the outside, struggling with on the outside. What are you struggling with learning in your specialty MOS? Let's talk about that too. Like that is the key way to break these barriers down in our regimented organization. Then you put them back up because they're, they're needed for combat and for, for duty, right? We're not saying keep them down, but break them down for a little, 
talk, 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 and then putting back up. I think that's a way to make mentorship safe so that people can come to you. Well, and this is probably not even something that needs to be covered, but maybe it is, is maybe just having that conversation of this is how we're going to have to do that. Like this is when we're going to take those walls down and here's how we're going to put the walls back up. And so don't be surprised by it, but this is how we've got to have and manage this relationship and be able to do both and just be open about that's what the relationship needs to look like. Um, so I would love to hear about like your book covers all kinds of recruitment solutions. Um, but before we cover that, I mean, I would really like to ask, do you feel like Gen Z, especially those that are already in or coming in, what do you feel like they're imprinting? Because my on, because my guess is the, like not only COVID, but, and how the military, um, coped with COVID, but also the, exit from Afghanistan, I think was largely influential on Gen Z's perception of what the military as an institution is and what they should expect from the culture. So what do you think? What was your experience and what have you heard from others? Yeah, it's it's a good point. I think that on a macro geopolitical scale, right, the great power conflict is imprinting on us that we know that there's likely impending major war coming sometime. Maybe hopefully, God forbid, it never happens. From this point forward? Yeah, from this point yeah. forward, but even even like Gen Z a couple of years ago, because we because we're at remember that pivot, right? Right, as you said, the Afghanistan has a huge imprint on us, right? Yeah. But now we're on this pivot of like, okay, so what's our next mission, right? Like we're not at war anymore. We had this. I don't even want to go into sort of the Afghanistan analysis. Obviously, it had a huge yeah. imprint on us and a lot of interesting relationships with with all of our leaders, right? Mm-hmm. Again, speaking fully positive of the chain of command, but. We now know, okay, we're done with almost that region of the world, potentially. We're done with that war, right? Like, what is next? Now, what is the purpose of the military? Like, what what are we looking for next? So this has a big macro imprint of like, okay, you know, force design, the Marine Corps, Marine Corps is going through a lot of rapid change, right? A lot of key things need to need to change and, and, and move around. I think we're struggling, and, and this has been said before, right, for that identity for that mission. Like the institution needs to find its next mission, right? And it doesn't have a clear mission and a clear, like, we're going to fight terrorism or we're going to this place or this. Like we literally, right now, you don't know where you're going to end up or be sent because we know these large storm clouds are gathering, but that may very well pass before the the Gen Z generation ever, you know, gets action, right? Okay, so this is interesting. Alpha. Can I, can we unpack this for just a second? Because mm-hmm. I feel like millennials and older reached the end of that two decades and were desperate for rest, desperate for peacetime. And so what I think I'm hearing you say is Gen Z came in with what, what are we doing next? Yep. So do, do you feel like Gen Z hear about the threats of Russia and China from a perspective of that's what we're kind of aiming for? That could be the, the purpose of where we're headed and going back to your protection mindset. Or do you feel like Gen Z has a concept of the necessity of peacetime? Yeah, it's a good point. So I think I, I'm going to cop out and say like both. Right. I think we don't necessarily want to be rushing into war. We saw the destructiveness of wars, wars that you know necessarily we don't necessarily win, clear victor. You know, there's there's a lot of trauma and damage from war. So I get that second point about the necessity piece. Of that, but I think from a military perspective, from military Gen Zers, they still need that guiding purpose. So we hear about these two large competitors, we understand it, but we're not on a clear mission in many ways of how we're going to combat that, right? It's not very mm-hmm. clear on a perception level, at least at the junior ranks. Maybe it's different yeah. than the other. Like I'm only speaking, again, anecdotally and you know, not in my official capacity, but it's like, okay, so what are we – we're doing a bunch of exercises. We're sort of protecting here and there, but what is that protection going to look like? Is it going to be terribly scary like World War II and totally you know, mass, mass war, mass – uh, intensity, or is the conflict going to look totally different? It's going to be all these gray zone areas, all mm-hmm. this cyber online that we're fighting in the home front and also in the cyber front and also, and it sort of becomes a totally different analysis. And that is leaving a big imprint on us because that's what our leaders are putting into us at our training. That's what we're trying to learn. But I think just like how the generation is trying to find its purpose in an online mm-hmm. world, and I'll give you my book thesis in a second. I think the service is also trying to find its purpose and Gen yeah. Z is coming in. That's the imprint. It's like, okay, so what are we doing all this for? What, what am I doing in the thousand exercises traveling all around the world actually for, for a yeah. war that may never come for a war that may look totally different. Like what is the purpose? And we need to, 
was struggling to understand, basically. Do you feel like that affects that inability to answer that right now? Do you feel like that affects both retention of Gen Z and also recruiting? Absolutely. Absolutely. 100%. I think that people are like, well, what's the purpose? You know, I went through all this training. I'm not doing the re- a real world thing. You know, I went mm-hmm. through all this. It's it's like, what happens? Like one one very glib way to say my book is like, well, how do you solve the recruiting crisis? Have a major war, then people will sign up. Someone said that to me once. And there, there's some truth, as, as scary as it is, there's some truth to that. Now, it totally negates the fact you need a professional military that's as lethal and well-trained as possible to prepare for that. You don't want to be caught flat-footed, right? Mm-hmm. But there's some truth of purpose and necessity mm-hmm. drive invention and 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 drive you know purpose and necessity drive purpose and necessity so there is a struggle a little bit for what is the meaning of all of this you know i did four years i ran around to do a bunch of training well now i'm getting out because what's what's next you know and i've heard that echoed at some of the junior ranks well and considering like we can't create that solution nor would we want to as far as like world war three right are you yeah. saying that um, and I really don't want to put words in your mouth. And so if, if you can't answer this, that's okay. Um, do you do you feel like the institution could do a little bit better in messaging what the purpose is in the meantime, that's, that that goes behind brand messaging and communicating to Gen Z? Yeah, so, and it's a good point. I want to give a quick side of, of putting mm-hmm. words in the mouth and, and discussion. I'm adamant about talking. And the reason I am is because Biggest business lesson I learned in business school, uh, a very famous CEO came to speak to her. She's, she's a total boss. Uh, many, many Fortune 500 companies she led. And she explained those at the lowest level at the closest to the problem will always understand the best solutions. Mm-hmm. And she took over some major food companies. And the first thing she did for a whole month, the CEO of the company, millions of dollars of salary, she would go into the local like food service I can't really say the company. Well, I guess I could say the company, or whatever. But she would go into the lowest level, and she would work in like the chain at the lowest level because she'd see the entire business and how it ran. Mm-hmm. And I think in our major bureaucracy, we always had a great um, history and trend of senior leaders coming out to the front of the battle, leading from the front. But it becomes harder and harder in staff work and bureaucracy, where the people who are in charge of this marketing and perception sometimes are not directly mm-hmm. talking to the enlisted soldier. And this is where one of my main points is about branding and messaging. A, I want to have these conversations because they're so important. B, the people that are going to give you the best solutions are the junior ranks that are seeing the problems and understand them the best. And C, you have now technology tools to do that on an unprecedented and valuable yeah. scale, right? Yeah. I'm going to bring up TikTok. I know everyone hates TikTok. It's a Chinese spy platform. We could talk about that on the classified side or somewhere else, right? Regardless, TikTok, Instagram, you have people making videos, thousands of videos, and you have natural language processing and AI abilities to parse the data from those videos. So with all these individual enlisted and individual junior officer running around making videos, like it or not, I think sometimes it's very bad when people make videos that disparage the uniform, but we should be harvesting this and being able to understand what are the problems. We should be able to say, okay, 10 Marines at base X made a video about a lack of camouflage, uh, a lack of camis, right? Well, that should be a problem. That NLP formula AI should pick that up and route that right up to the chain of command and say, hey, there's a real thing going on here. There's a trend starting here, right? Understanding that, analyzing that is super, super, super effective. And they, that's why it's so important to have these conversations and actually be open to talk. As long as it's all in constructive, I think we should be encouraged, right? I'm not going against the chain of command. So I know I got a little bit away from your question there. And I apologize. No, 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 I no. Important. I think it's all great. Yeah. I think it's all great. Um <laughs> Okay, so I know that your book definitely gives us a lot of, um, and I, there's no way I would ask you to give away everything that's in the book and also <laughs> um, even attempt to. I would love for you to kind of share what do you think, especially since you've talked to your peers, what do you think it's going to take within our military culture? So maybe not just the institution, but the military culture and what it feels like in the culture to keep Gen Z. Because what I'm hearing and seeing across the board is um, bringing in these values of family, bringing in these values of wellness, like we talked about. And I, um, what I'm seeing is, is if there's not that respect and space for personal time, for family, for some of those other values that are I don't want to say even competing. They're just really important values. Then um, I think I think everybody is going to leave and choose their own wellness before the institution. Yeah. So what would you say and what are other people saying as far as reasons to stay and maybe what needs to shift within the culture to keep Gen Z? 
Absolutely. So I actually think it's an easy, easily described answer because it's so macro, right? Because yes, there's 21 tactical or operational level answers that I give, and it's too hard to summarize. We can go through each one of them. It could be an hour conversation. But I was having a conversation about this literally last night with four of my enlisted Marines, and I I, it dawned on me, and I, I've said this before, but it, it's such a powerful thing. And it's, we are the social media generation. We grew up with social media. We're trained by it. We understand it. All these online groups. We are looking for connection. Yeah. Simple. The most valuable thing in life, right? Connection to other humans. The military, the value proposition is that it is the world's greatest physical social network. Full mm-hmm. stop. We have better and deeper connections in our military culture than any other workplace or environment, right? The family connection, the concept of the people that you're literally serving left and right with potentially are the people that are going to save or or not save your life or hopefully save your life one day, right? Like you will find a deeper level of connection than anyone in the military than a peer from a random job who you may go sit for nine to five in, but you're not working out with them, eating with them, literally living in a barracks with them. And I think the perception, so this is a perception and marketing thing though, has to really play that up. I think we've always understood that and intuitively had that, but it's not in the forefront of Gen Z minds. It's not even in the forefront of our forces minds, yeah. right? It's yeah. like, oh yeah, I'm doing whatever. But the true benefit, you hear this from all the veterans, veterans go through heartbreak when they, the day they get out. It's not the institution or the purpose right. or the uniform. It's the connection it's the that they lose. Mm-hmm. It's I am now a former Marine, right? I am now a former whatever. Like it is the people. It's all people. Right? The Harvard Kennedy study shows us, you know, it's the most valuable or the longest term social study ever created, right? They surveyed like uh, 300 people in Boston 100 plus years ago and they tracked all these metrics of their life. And the number one metric of happiness, of long-term happiness, it wasn't tied to socioeconomic, it wasn't even tied to health. It was the value of a few key connections in your life. Do you have a few key people mm-hmm. in your life that you're really close with? And that is something the military will give by nature of the experience, by nature of the challenging experience, uh, better than anything else. So that's that's the anecdote. That's the, uh, that's the answer, um, the antidote that has to be really pushed from all perspectives. So let me challenge that because I agree with it, but I he- let me challenge it yeah. in a way that if somebody was here in the room or having the conversation with us, this is what I hear from leaders, especially leaders who are um, having family events or marriage events or having opportunities to physically bring your family members together and actually do life together and have an experience, the turnout rates are lower than ever. Yeah. And so the yeah. biggest thing people are stuck on when it when it comes to forming community is people, I think, are not showing up because they have to choose between do I give up family time or do I spend more time with my colleagues? And so how would you encourage, knowing that it's a big problem, it's a wicked problem to solve, how would you encourage those leaders who are really trying to build those connections to get Gen Z, especially to turn out for some of these things? Yeah. Yeah. You're saying, you know, mandatory fun time that doesn't work, you know, and, and it's true. It, there, there is a, there is a, it's not easy, right? Like I or wish would you I could... say we need to overhaul and change what we're doing, like the kinds of so, events that so we're doing. It, it's a, you're right. So, and, and I think the events is only one perspective, right? Events can bring people together, shared experiences, bring people together, but it's, it's even more, it's it's the increased conversational dynamics that, that matter, yeah. right? So the most valuable way that you're going to get close to someone, really close, is having just continued interaction, right? That that's yeah. there's no doubt about that, right? If I eat at the chow hall every day at the same time and I sit with this person every single day, you instantly are going to become extremely close, right? Yeah. One barbecue once a month with your your spouse and his spouse, like it's helpful, but it's not really going to create this continued repetitive feedback thing. So in short, there's no yeah. simple solution to saying, you know, we need this event or that. I wish I wish I could craft an event. I wish I could. No, but I, th- I think you're bringing up a really important point that I wonder how many people are actually talking to their colleagues during the day, like going down the hall, having conversations, connecting on a deeper level and starting with that at work and then expanding that to families because we're close and we're building trust at work with our leaders too. And then that leads to my family's coming because I trust the people that I work with. So maybe that that's, I think we can take what you're saying and apply it on a bigger level. And just the chow hall concept, like yeah. it, it, it shocked me, you know, at 
at in training, right? Because you're on a, the same exact schedule. You eat chow at the same exact time with the same exact people. Those are my closest friends in the Marine Corps, right? Then you sometimes get into garrison life in various branches of the military, and you're all. It, it, it's more like a regular job. He's eat, he's bringing lunch from home. He's eating at this time. She's eating at, like it's not as communal and connected as as it really could be, or as it once was back in certain periods of time. But you know, meals are a huge factor but again it's just repetitive continued time from a psych perspective uh, and this actually goes with relationships and marriage too they say like the only way to predict um people liking each other more or actually getting closer is just continued time exposure right mm-hmm. more time exposure to similar experiences increases that factor by atomic like there's that that's what the studies show and what they say and there's there's some interesting truth to that you know instead of i'm sitting in my own mm-hmm. hey just typing typing or I'm just doing an exercise, whatever. It's like really, can I really connect with the same people and the same experience? That forms a key, key, key bond. No, I love that. And I would just add that when we do that enough, then we have a chance to go through suffering and difficulty too. And then I think that bonds people even more when we go through shared struggle together, which goes to your deployments and going to like embracing the suck and all that kind of stuff. So um, I know we're almost out of time, but um, is there anything else that you would add on the recruiting side? I felt like that was a little bit of retention, but maybe that wasn't recruiting too. But anything else um, that you would kind of really strongly share, especially if it's a military leader that's listening? Um, Actually, you know, I mean, everybody's in charge of it, but what would you say um, is maybe one of your favorite or the ones that you've been thinking about the most since writing the book that you feel like is really maybe a good starting point for the institution to think about as far as recruitment? Yeah. So, and I was asked this at like the highest policy levels in the DOD. And I said, okay, here's the one thing I would like you to write into statute, right? If I ever testify in front of Congress, this is what I'm going to say. Uh, I'll give you, I'll give you the answers, right? It's, it's that we have to take responsibility for recruiting at every single level of the institution. What does that mean? It means it by statute should be mandated that every single person, every Gen Zer that just joined, I don't care if you're an E1 private who just got through training, doesn't know anything, right? Respectfully, you have to make one recruiting phone call to someone back home. You mm-hmm. have to have one conversation about your experience to that one friend in high school who didn't join or that person two years younger who you were kind of close with on whatever sports team and discuss. And you have to actually take control. It, it, it boggles me. The private sector, right? I was at a very fast-paced, intense company. All of us had a duty, a secondary duty of recruiting. The CEO's mm. time, 40% of his time, the most important, smartest person in the company, 40% of his time was, was to recruiting. Recruiting people is everything. Mm-hmm. And as an institution uh, and big bureaucracy, we sort of push this recruiting duty to recruiting command, which does a very good job with the problems that it has, obviously has things it could work on, but it's not fair. It doesn't make sense. The person that's going to save your life one day is brought there by some other crazy means. Like we all have a responsibility to bring that next generation, that person in, to tell them the good, the bad, the ugly, not just to convince them to join. That's not what I'm saying, but to have the conversation, to get the word of the military out there. And if we're all influencers in our own little communities and societies, you're going to increase the saliency of the military, right? As veteran population has decreased, we've lost that 10 million person military in World War II. Everyone had a brother or father who fought. It was easy to understand military life. Veterans, 1% of the population, it's hard if 99 people don't know about the military and that one person isn't telling the next 10 people. So we have to bring it down to the lowest level. I I should be required to make one phone call a year to someone, even if it's just, hey, how are you? I'm the military, military experience. Connect with someone that I know that I think would be a decent fit and tell them about the military because that is the way that you start to push out military life. Such a great answer. And, you know, speaking of influencers, uh, mandatory fun day, you know, I think everybody loves yeah, listening to him. I, yeah. I heard him say, you know, one of the worst things that we're doing is if we are getting on social media, we're only sharing the negative stuff. We're not also sharing what's great about this tribe, what's great about this culture, and some of the other things that you were just sharing. And if we could share both, I think it's more of an authentic answer of what it actually means to be in this culture. And I think it also would heal a little bit of the older generation that is exhausted, burned out, and probably a little bit resentful right now is that a lot of the things that we've been grateful for and that we really valued, we haven't seen in a long time. And so I think there's some sadness there. And so I think that your generation is is inviting us to be grateful, but inviting us to see that it's possible again, and maybe even encouraging us to come out of our shells and maybe even be the ones that start those conversations and bring bringing that mentoring opportunity 
opportunity, but also being willing to listen and learn. And so absolutely. Matthew, is there anything else that you would want to share? Definitely share on um, where people can get your book, um, where they can um, hear more about you, but anything else that comes to mind that you would want to encourage leaders on any level, really? Nope. I, I think in the end of the day, just have these conversations, allow the junior people to have these conversations because they know the problem best. The only look tactic strategy, take that. That's the senior level. That's the experience and knowledge and wisdom. But recruiting the next person is going to come best from the person that was just recruited. So this is the one conversation where it's important to have at the junior level. So that's my call to action. Have the conversation. The book is available on Amazon. I, I appreciate anyone who's interested in it. I'll, I'll never make a single dollar profit on it. So as long as these conversations are being had and the book is being used as a tool, then I, I know I did my mission well. When I think back to that game of chicken on the seesaw with my brother all those years ago, I must say I was always at a disadvantage. My brother, three years older than me, was faster and could slip off his seat quicker than I could plant my feet on the ground. The truth is, I just wanted him to seesaw, and his choice to abandon the game broke my trust in him and my confidence in the seesaw altogether. Perhaps that is how Gen Z feels around those of us who are sorting through the wear and tear of decades of war. While our experiences are real and should not be minimized, many of us have filled our rucksacks with unnecessary negativity and cynicism and then made it heavier by adding that to the negativity of online perspectives that add more weight to the tipping seesaw of distrust. Yet despite a recruiting crisis, Gen Z are still coming in, eager to join with a purpose to fulfill all their own. They have climbed on the seesaw and are anxiously awaiting what the rest of us will do. I agree with Matthew. We have forgotten how to sit together, to break bread together, and to do life together. If we are willing to take off the rucksack and engage again, Gen Z's fresh perspective might remind us of why we began in the first place, just as much as we can teach them how to endure difficulty. After all, taking turns is exactly what makes the seesaw fun and what restores confidence in the game again. The Military Culture Shift podcast is sponsored by New Res and written and produced by me, author, speaker, and military clinical consultant, Corey Weathers. The closing credit song is I'll See You Someday, written, produced, and performed by Gen Z military teen Harlan Adams. This is a supplemental leadership podcast for the book Military Culture Shift, The Impact of War, Money, and Generational Perspective on Morale, Retention, and Leadership. Copies of the book can be purchased on Amazon, militaryfamilybooks.com, and your other favorite retailers. More information including graphs, data, and other resources mentioned in the book can be found on my website, coreyweathers.com.